Tennessee football took part in scrimmage number one on a Friday night. What has been the talk this weekend on how Nico and the offense looked? What about that defense? News and notes here on a Monday morning. This is Locked On Vols. You are Locked On Vols, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Monday morning, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Vols. I am Eric Kane. Can't thank you enough for being here, making us a part of your show each and every weekday morning, making us your first listen and um, can't can't do it without you every day or so. Thanks so much for making us a part of your morning routine. We're a part of Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every single day. You guys know where you can find this, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and download to the channel and tell your friends about this show. we got a fun show coming up today. Going to say all the scrimmage notes that I have from what went down at Neyland Stadium Friday night here in a matter of seconds. And, and then I'm going to take a look back at the nine practices so far, some of the common themes of fall camp, what we know about this football team. That's coming up in segments number two. And then Saturday Down South put out a bold prediction piece for the SEC, a list of 25 different bold predictions. And I'm going to highlight some of the things they said about Tennessee, and we're going to decide if we're going to agree with those or we're not going to agree with those bold predictions. All that and more here on a Monday show. Big shout out to FanDuel for making this show possible, where you can make every moment more. It's over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Okay, guys, so um, the scrimmage on Friday night, and, you know, it was typical, everything that we heard, and it felt like Josh Heupel, um, after the scrimmage on Friday night, was very pleased with kind of what he saw out there over the course of an hour and a half, and Kind of, kind of where his team is at this point in time. I don't think that he's satisfied. I think he knows that there's a long way to go in certain areas, but he seemed to be in good spirits on Friday night. And you know, just judging by uh, body language and what he says, you can get a kind of good, uh, you can get a good feel on where Josh Heupel is. You know, personality-wise, I guess, mood-wise after scrimmages, and he seemed to be okay. Now, um, it was apparent that everybody that I've spoken to and everything, and the reports that you've seen, as I thought would be the case. Defense won the scrimmage, and, and that doesn't mean that the offense is going to be bad. That doesn't mean that Nico had an awful day. It just means defenses typically are farther along than offenses at this point in fall camp. And, and when you throw into the fact that you have a grown, veteran, experienced, 13-man defensive rotation on the defensive line, that makes it even more of the while. And all those guys played on Friday night. <laughs> There's a ton of guys that did not play on Friday night, and I'll, I'll get into that here in a moment. But you know, the defense won the scrimmage, and that's kind of what I expected. But did hear that Deshaun Bishop in the backfield, who got the start for Dylan Sampson, who didn't play, um, you know, had a, had a pretty pretty decent day. Kind of going into the scrimmage, I, I listed him as one of the players that needed to show up for Tennessee, and all he does is all he's done is shown up for Tennessee. And I'll talk a little bit more about him in segment number two. But it sounds like Deshaun Bishop had a had a pretty decent scrimmage. It sounded like. The secondary, you know, Josh Hopple mentioned the secondary a couple of times when he spoke to the media, you know, after the scrimmage. Sounds like the secondary had a, a pretty decent day. And uh, Jordan Matthews is said to have made a really, really nice play on a ball, a 50 50 high point in the scrimmage. And, you know, as he's trying to solidify himself as that number four cornerback. And y you might be hearing this or watching this and saying, well, number four cornerback, he's not going to be a player. Who cares? You got two quarterbacks out there that start. You know, Jalen McMurray, the transfer from Temple, is going to be the backup on either side, and he's going to be the go and you know the first guy off the bench. Uh, but as you saw last year, look at that cornerback position, how many cornerbacks had to play, and and look at in 2022, how many cornerbacks had to play. I mean, there's it's so many people get caught up in starters, both offensively and defensively. And man, football is a game where you play a lot of guys. So sure, starting's important, but in places where it's a rotational position, it's not everything. And plus, in football, you play a lot of guys anyway. So, you know, Jordan Matthews continuing to come along, I think, has been um, a, a really, really good sign. Uh, you know, Tennessee put out the video on there. It was a pump fake to the left. Nico found tight end Ethan Davis over the middle uh, for a touchdown catch. That looked good. And uh, what got me more excited, you know, possibly than anything, was that Tennessee was throwing the football over the middle. Tennessee was throwing the football to the tight end over the middle. And I'll talk more about Ethan Davis here in a moment. But, boy, he just... He looks clean. He looks good. He looks at home um, and certainly looked uh, the, the part on on that play. Um, Nathan Laycock is or Leacock, excuse me, continues. His name continues to be thrown out a, a, a lot here in fall camp. And his name was thrown out, you know, after the scrimmage on Friday, I believe, by Heupel as well. 
Um, he's had a really good camp. I uh, made a couple of game, a couple of plays in the scrimmage, taking advantage of those reps that uh, were, were left out there from a laundry list of guys who didn't compete. And I'll tell you that here uh, in just a moment. Um, with everybody healthy, he's still way down the pecking order. But you know, Tennessee's going to lose some wide receivers after this season, and um, you know, Nathan Leacock's a guy that I think has a, has a body and has a frame that can be really good at this level. So it's been good to hear him and his progression continuing to uh, to come along a little bit. Uh, Jamal McCoy, the cornerback from uh, the transfer cornerback from Oregon State, freshman All American, um, he flashed. He's he's said to have flashed in in that scrimmage, and that that's good because that's what I expected. I think he's going to be a really really good player. Um, overall, it was it was the defense that kind of set the tone and the defense that kind of won that scrimmage, and um, that's good. But, it, but when when you hear that Deshaun Bishop had a good day, that means Tennessee ran the football you know well at points and times. When you see the video of, of Nico hitting Ethan Davis, you know that the passing game was effective at points in times. Um, it just goes to show me that even though the defense won the game, there are things offensively that that worked and you can build off of. Now, there were a lot of guys, especially on the offensive side of the football, that did not participate in the scrimmage. Tennessee is being overly cautious with so many players right now. If the season would have started on Friday night, several of these players I'm mentioning right now would have played. Okay, so don't hear me wrong. Like Dylan Sampson, he's not going to scrimmage at all this fall, okay? Nor should he because you have injury questions behind him with Cam Seldon. Also, you're trying to replace Shabari Small and, and Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright, he looked really, really good in NFL preseason the other day, as did Jalen, uh, as, did, as did Joe Milton and Hendon Hooker. So shout out to those VFLs. Um, but, you know, Dylan Sampson would have played if the season started on Friday night, but he was held out. But anyway, this is what the starters on offense look like. Um, quarterback was Nico. Running back was Deshaun Bishop. Peyton Lewis went with the twos. Wide receivers was some combination of Chris Brazel, Squirrel White, Caleb Webb, and Chaz Nimrod. Uh, the tight ends were the three tight ends that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about here. Ethan Davis, Holden Stays, Miles Kitzelman. Your left tackle was Larry Johnson. Your left guard was Jackson Lampley. And then your starters at center, right guard, Cooper Mays, Javante Spragans. Your right tackle was Dane Davis. On defense, uh, Keenan, let's see, your safeties were Andre Turrentine and Will Brooks. Your star player, uh, this is the starters, mind you, the star player was Christian Harrison. Your cornerbacks were Gibson and McCoy. And your linebackers were Jeremiah T. Lander and Caleb Perry. So by process of elimination on defense, Arian Carter did not scrimmage. Keenan Peely did not scrimmage. But I think for the most part, defense was kind of intact. Those might have been the only two highlights of guys who didn't scrimmage. The entire defensive line scrimmage, and it sounds like the entire secondary scrimmage as well. On offense, of course, Dylan Sampson did not scrimmage. Jeremiah, or not Jeremiah's heard, uh, Lance Hurd at left tackle, who continuing to ease him back into things after he had a cleanup procedure over the summer. John Campbell, who in my opinion is going to be day-to-day -day in terms of practicing all season long. Guys, remember, he's going into his seventh year. There's a lot of miles on those tires, right? A lot of tread on those tires. Um, he did not scrimmage. Brew McCoy did not scrimmage. Dante Thornton did not scrimmage. Mike Matthews did not scrimmage. And there's some other guys that, of course, did not scrimmage as well. But, um, you know, overall, I think it was a, a successful scrimmage, number one for Tennessee. They're going to scrimmage again on Thursday and Thursday morning. They were on the practice field on Sunday. They'll be back on the practice field Monday. Tuesday will be an off day. Wednesday is a practice day. And then they'll scrimmage on Thursday, and, and hopefully some of these guys, you know, not named Brew McCoy, Dylan Sampson, will start making their way back and start, you know, working a little bit. Um, you know, James Pierce had a really, really good day, and, you know, there was a couple comments about how James Pierce made, you know, Larry Johnson and Dane Davis look really, really silly on the edges. Um, sure, Dane Davis and, and Larry Johnson specifically are not as equipped and are not as good as Lance Hurd and John Campbell, but also James Pierce Jr. is very, very good. <laughs> very good. So, um, this offense will be hopefully next scrimmage a little bit more, you know, at at health, you know, health wise, we'll have a little bit more players that participate, and we'll see if it can get going. But um, it turns out, I mean, from from talking with people, it sounds like the the big injury was avoided, and that's what you always hope. That was point number one I had on Friday's show of what I'm looking for: no key injuries, and it sounds like it was a really really good day of work. When we come back in segment number two, I am going to tell you my key observations through five practices for Tennessee in fall camp th through nine, excuse me, nine practices for Tennessee in fall camp, the common themes, the surprises, the downfalls of fall camp so far that is coming up next. We continue on here. It's a Monday lockdown balls. Passion, drive, patience, the formula for winning championships 
So it also keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and leveled up to peak performances. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust skits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your parts are guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money is back. Because of eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive today at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Hey, I want to thank you guys for making Lockdown Balls your first listen each and every single day. For your second listen here today, um, if it's not locked on SEC, make it locked on college football. It's got some of the biggest topics and everything on the gridiron this season, NIL, expansion, transfer portal, college football playoffs, and so much more. Locked on College Football is available on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, it's a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Don't forget, tomorrow is uh, Twitter Tuesday, X Tuesday. So get in your questions, your comments, your concerns, and we'll answer those on tomorrow's show for you everydayers. All right, so I made a list here, and certainly we're you know approaching midway through camp. Only a couple more times will we get to uh, go out there and see any types of practices. Practice viewing will be open for the you know little parts that they're from, for the little parts that are available. Uh, we had it on Sunday. There'll be some this morning and then on Wednesday. And then after that, it's just back over to the, the complex for media availabilities from here on out. They're going to close things up. Um, but here are some things that I've observed so far through about midway through Tennessee fall camp. Not In no specific order here, just kind of the order that I wrote them down. And you'll see I kind of went defense first and then offense. Uh, number one, I think the defensive line is going to be great. And, and you know, I'm not breaking any news here. And I know we've talked about that all in the offseason. I know... <laughs> Rodney Garner, you know, put some clamps and put some, uh, you know, pump the brakes a little bit, but that's that's what Rodney Garner does. This defensive line is there's not going to be a deeper unit in all college football. And, and sure, you've got James Pierce, and he's a playmaker, and there's not another James Pierce on that defensive line. But boy, there's some there's some high ceiling type guys on that defensive line. Tyree Weathersby is one that comes to mind. Tyree West. Um, Omar Norman Lott, who had five and a half sacks from the interior. Think Elijah Simmons. Could this be the season that it finally clicks for Elijah Simmons? He stays healthy and gives Tennessee something, you know, at every single point throughout the season where he's not missing a, a month, you know, worth of, of games. He's never going to play 20 or 30 snaps in a game, but can you get a good 15 out of Elijah Simmons? I'm intrigued to see. I mean, so many other guys I haven't even mentioned. Dominic Bailey, Big O. Bryson Eason, who might be the best of the interior bunch to begin with. David Hobbs, Jackson Moy. Uh, Rodney Garner said, hey, I had a plan for Jackson Moy, and he didn't say this on record, but that plan was to redshirt him this year. And and why not, when you look at everybody you have on the defensive front, why not redshirt him, get him another year for later? But Rodney Garner says, hey, I had a plan for Jackson Moy. He changed that plan, meaning he was going to redshirt. He is not going to redshirt anymore. He is going to play. Um, just adding more and more depth to the interior and really that defensive line overall. Um, someone do, does need to step up, just like we talked with Dalton Wasserman about it from Pro Football Focus last week. You know, somebody needs to step up and kind of be that Robin to James Pierce's Batman. But overall, I think this defensive line, again, not breaking any news, is going to be very, very good. In turn with that, I think the secondary is going to be okay. Do I think the secondary is going to be all SEC worthy? Probably not. Do I think the, the secondary is going to be really, 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 really good? It's certainly not going to be the strength of the defense, I can tell you that. But because the defensive line is going to be wreaking havoc, because the defensive line is going to have James Pierce getting after the quarterback, because the defensive line is going to be one of the league leaders in TFLs and sacks, it's all tied in, man. I mean, that as good as your defensive line is, should duplicate in terms of success in the back end. Why? Well, because the back end doesn't have to play as much man-on-man. -man. They can play a little bit more of the zone. Or... They can play a little bit man under zone over the top and take some more chances um, because that defensive line is making it tougher on the quarterback. He's got to get rid of the football quick, 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 and sometimes be forced into bad decisions. I think the secondary is going to be fine. Um, quarterbacks, you, you know your three top four right now. Okay, um, Boo Carter needs to continue to come along. I didn't even mention Boo Carter in segment one. It sounded like he had a, a pretty decent scrimmage. He didn't start. Christian Harrison started, but he came along and made some plays. And Josh Hopple spoke specifically about Boo Carter after the scrimmage. So I think it's more about getting reps and feeling comfortable and continuing to come along a little bit. Um, eventually, he should be the starter, in my opinion, at the star position. 
and so you, you kind of got to feel about the star. It's just the safety spots. Andre Turnton's going to be one. Who's going to be the other? Is it going to be Jacoby Thomas from MTSU? Is it going to be sophomore John Slaughter? Is it going to be the you know wise you know crafty veteran walk on and Will Brooks? All three of those guys will play, and I hope that there's a genuine rotation at safety this year, and you're not just seeing the same two guys. But which one's going to start? I don't know. Um, but I think it's going to be you know okay. Um, defense is going to be the strength of the team. Now, hear me out. Maybe not the strength of the team, but the defense is going to be a strength. Is is how I should better phrase that. Led by that defensive front, linebackers who I haven't even mentioned yet, and a healthy Keenan Peely, Arian Carter, Jeremiah T. Lander, who are going to be so much better than where they were last year, especially Arian Carter dropping some weight. Because I mean, I could tell. I mean, he was as a recruit, he's he he committed to Memphis to be a running back. And then, you know, he blossomed late in his senior year. Tennessee jumped on. And then when he signed with Tennessee, they're like, hey, put on weight, put on weight, put on weight. And he looked really, really good and fluid. And, you know, his hips look good and all that, football terms. Um, out there in space, right? But in fall camp and in the spring, in, in fall camp and in the fall compared to spring, he looks stiff because he gained so much weight. I thought he was a little slow, and I thought he played slow last year. Well, it turns out he was, you know, probably too heavy, and he's dropped the weight. And I think he's going to be so much better for it. Anyway, I think the defense is going to be a strength. I don't think it's going to be, oh, well, here's the offense bailing out the defense again. Oh, well, Josh Hopple's offense can take care of a defense no matter what. I think it's going to be real, true, complimentary football. And I think this football team, the football season is going to be good for Tennessee. Let's move to offense real quick. Uh, tight ends, I think, won't be good. But, well, tight ends, I was going to say won't be good, but will be great. Maybe that's maybe that's too much. Because I, I talk with people about this all the time, and it's funny. People are like, well, will this be the first year where they, have, they incorporate the tight ends in the passing game? I mean, guys, like... Jacob Warren and McCallum Castles combined for nine touchdowns last year. Nine touchdowns. Like, if that's not a part of the passing game, I don't know what, I don't know what is. In my opinion, I don't think a Tennessee tight end in this offense will ever be a 100-yard receiver in a football game. However, in saying all this, boy, Ethan Davis looks good. Ethan Davis looks like one of the best receiving options on this team, and I do believe he's going to be a main target for Nico. I think he looks like one of the best receivers on this team playing tight end. So I still don't think that any Tennessee tight end is going to finish the game with 11 receptions for 98 yards and a touchdown. But that group, that they're going to play three. They've tried to play three at that spot every year. They've only been able to play two with Jacob Warren and somebody else, Fayon or McCassles, McCallan Castles. They're going to play three with Holton Stays, Ethan Davis, and Miles Kitzelman. I think that group's going to be better overall this year because of the depth and because of the versatility in that room. I've liked the tight end room a lot so far in fall camp. Um, Deshaun Bishop just won't go away. Again, he's had a lot of opportunities to shine in these camp-like settings, spring camp, fall camp. And, of course, in fall camp he had that season-ending injury and he didn't get a chance to do anything last year. Um, when all said and done and everybody's healthy on the depth chart – Deshaun Bishop should be the fourth running back, in my opinion. Sampson, Cam Seldon, Peyton Lewis, Deshaun Bishop, and then you've got Khalifa Keith, and, and then so on and so forth. Um, just kind of the way it's stacked up right now. However, Deshaun Bishop just won't go away. He continues to show up. He continues to be durable. He continues to show that he can run in this offense. So is there a spot to where, over the course of the, you know, the remainder of fall camp, that he shows like, hey, not only am I going to be an option when Cam Seldon's coming back from injury to begin the season, that number two option potentially, but when everybody's healthy, maybe I can get a carrier to a game. Maybe I can sub in in this package. I don't know. I'm intrigued, man. I like Deshaun Bishop. I like the story. He's from Corns High School. I covered his entire high school career. I, I would like to see that story, but I want to give some props to him so far in fall camp. He showed up and he showed out, so good for him, but know that he is down that depth chart when everybody is healthy. Wide receivers are loaded. We know about that. I mean, the quality of depth of wide receiver, I think, um, Brew McCoy, Squirrel White, Chris Brazel. I think those are your starters if I if the season started today. Chaz Nimrod's going to play. I think Dante Thornton, when healthy, is going to play. Mike Matthews is going to play. Um, we'll see about Caleb Webb. Um, Tennessee's deep at wide receiver this year, and they're a lot deeper than they've ever been under the Josh Hopple regime. And then finally, I think the offensive line is going to be good enough. Throw in Lance Hurd, throw in John Campbell, Cooper Mays coming back, Javante Spragans, and, and Andre Carrick, and you know, and or Jackson Lampley and, and Dane Davis. 
Uh, those are all veterans who have played so much football for you outside of Lance Hurd. Um, I think this offensive line is going to be really, really good. And I think that you're going to have enough options there. And you're starting to see some some reserves come around and, and starting to play a little bit better. And that's, that is always, always good to see. So, again, those are some of my observations. Sure, there's a long way to go in the secondary. Sure, um, your, your fourth tackle is very much in question. Uh, but, I mean, we know this team like the back of our hands. We're listening to Locked On Balls, which is nothing but Tennessee football every single day for 30 minutes, right? We look at the nitty-gritty, but take, take take a look from the national perspective. Yeah, Nico's got a hit for sure, but, boy, this Tennessee team looks good and is starting to round into form midway through camp. Hey, when we come back, there's some bowl predictions from Saturday down south. I'm going to pull out the ones regarding Tennessee, and we're going to agree or disagree with this bowl take. That's coming up next. We continue on here with a Monday edition of Locked on Balls. I want to see about our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel is America's number one sports sportsbook. I love sports. I love them so much. Never one on the stop, and thankfully... Once we get further and further along in this month, they're going to start ramping up again in a huge way with college football and the NFL coming back. But the playoffs, the NBA Finals, the Stanley Cup Finals, they're, they've are they been over with for quite some time. Sports, they weren't quite sporting like I want them to, but I'll tell you what, over at FanDuel, let me keep the sports going all summer long when things were slow. All I had to do was open the app and dream about big bets anytime that I was in the mood and you as well. And you probably have already noticed if you're a casual or if you're an everyday or over at a, a FanDuel uh, the sports app, that for all customers, they've had a daily boost or a bonus. Every single customer, a daily boost or a bonus. So you could dream about big bets all summer long, every single day. So head on over to FanDuel.com if you haven't already, and check on that daily boost or bonus here to end the month of August. FanDuel, it's America's number one sports book. FanDuel, it's where you can make every moment more. And FanDuel, it is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, we got a final segment left here of this Monday edition of Locked On Balls. We'll, we will be short and sweet here in segment number three. Um, don't forget, get in those questions, those comments. You every day or whatever you have for X Tuesday. It's the mailbag portion of the show. We'll answer all those on a Tuesday podcast. So, over at Saturday Down South, Connor Aguero pointed out tw- uh, he put out uh, published an article. 25 bold predictions for the SEC in 2024. A lot of good stuff in here for... All 16 teams. I'm not going to go through and read all of them for, for for all the other teams. Some good ones in here that are that are our bold for sure. But there are about five, one, two, three, four, five, that have to do somewhat with the University of Tennessee. The 24th bold prediction here says the SEC leader in 40-yard catches is Squirrel White. That's what he has to say about that. White's abilities weren't maximized by Joe Milton, period. With Nico Iamaliava and a healthy Brew McCoy to take some of that attention underneath, I'm back on board with White becoming the guy that I thought he'd be last year as Jalen Hyatt's replacement. Now, they're different type of players. Jalen Hyatt was straight ahead speed. Squirrel White is fast, don't get me wrong, but Squirrel White's a a different type of receiver. But the explosives, the 30, the 40 yards down the field, I mean, you saw Squirrel White come in and link up with Joe Milton in 2022 uh, in blowout games, man, they had like a 40-yard reception every, you know, completion every every blowout game, it felt like. Didn't see an awful lot of that last year, but I do agree that I think we're going to see more of that, more of the, maybe it's not the squirrel, but he would be, you know, the, the, the targets, the most likely candidate to be on the receiving end of the target to get down the field and have explosive play. So I thought that was interesting. The SEC leader in 40-yard catches will be squirrel white. A um, couple slots down. The bold prediction is this. James Pierce Jr. and Harold per- and Harold Perkins Jr., it's a linebacker from all, from uh, LSU, both miss out on the SEC sack title because of Nick Scorton. That's what he has to say on this. For the second time in as many seasons, yes, I believe Scorton leads the power conferences in sacks alongside Shamar Turner. And in a Mike Elko defense, the sky is the limit. Texas A&M defensive line will undoubtedly be the strength of the team, and the Purdue transfer will be a massive reason why that's the case. Yeah, Texas A&M's defensive line is going to be good. Mike Elko is a defensive coach. He was a former defensive coordinator before he went and head coach at Duke before he came back to College Station. Shamar Turner is a good player. And Nick Scorton coming over from Purdue, if you're unfamiliar with that name, he's a really, really good player. Purdue transferred into um, A&M this offseason. He's going to be a good player. But again, nobody's going to be deeper. Nobody's going to have a bigger rotation. Nobody's going to have as much high-end talent than Tennessee's defensive line. Does that mean 
James Pierce leads the league in sacks. I don't know. But I think that there's enough Robins in there, or at least candidates, to help alleviate some of the pressure from James Pierce to get back there in that backfield. Plus, I think James Pierce is going to be better this year in terms of his overall game and whatnot. Um, Harold Perkins Jr., is he going to be on the line or off the line? If he's off the line, then they got to blitz him a ton to even be in this conversation of leading the league in, in, in sacks. Um, skip down here to number 14, the bold prediction. Nico Iamaliava leads a top five offense in America. We like that one, right? Um, quotes in his first five seasons as head coach, Josh Heupel did nothing but crank out top eight offenses. Then Joe Milton limited what the Vols could do. And that streak ended boy, the YouTube commenter that says, I hate Joe Milton's having a rough day today. Uh, because Saturday down South is really laying it to Joe Milton. Uh, goes on to say, do you know what Iamaliava won't do? That's limit the ceiling of a hypo coached offense. There should be more explosive plays, more dynamic mobile quarterbacking, and a tougher group uh, for defenses to shut down. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, certainly, it was not Joe Milton's fault entirely last year. Um, I've said that numerous times throughout the offseason. And, you know, Joe Milton's been one of the better Tennessee quarterbacks in the last decade. Plus, when you look at all the bad quarterbacks that have been here really since uh, the end of the former era, uh, former era. Uh, Bray, Dobbs, Hooker, of course. Um, and then there's there's probably Milton. I'm not forgetting anybody, Emma. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the offense wasn't where it needed to be last year, and Milton played a part in that. So did the receivers. So did not having his starting center for the first five games of the season. Uh, I think Nico and this offense are going to get back to what Josh Heupel's been at, at even at even at Missouri when he was the offensive coordinator, but UCF and Tennessee. Being back in the top ten, being back in the top eight, and this one says top five, I, I would – Love to see that. Go down one more spot that says Talon Green leads Arkansas to an upset over Tennessee. And this is the one that I take exception to the most, and I'm sure you will as well. Quote, the Green-Bobby Petrino connection will catch someone by surprise. Tennessee could be the perfect team for that with the questions we have about the secondary, which could be in trouble facing a mobile quarterback who can buy time and find bigger body targets down the field. Perhaps still licking their wounds after an Oklahoma loss. I about said Alabama, sorry. Oklahoma loss. Tennessee doesn't come out with the right mindset to win in Fayetteville. Well, first and foremost, I would be lying to you if every time I look at Tennessee's schedule, I did not cringe, but kind of grimace a little bit whenever I, I do a, you know, I'm going down the schedule, win, loss, win, you know, when I do a win against Arkansas. Not because I don't think Tennessee will win. I think Tennessee will win. I think Tennessee will be favored by, you know, close to a touchdown, but it's still a game on the road in the SEC, and it's tough to win on the road in the SEC. It just is. But I think Tennessee handles business. I do. Okay, that's that's not what I'm saying here. I think Tennessee wins that game, so that's where I disagree with. Number two, I think Tennessee beats Oklahoma. I think it's going to be tough, but I think Tennessee beats Oklahoma for sure. Number three, after that Oklahoma game, there is a bye week. And then Tennessee returns to the road to take on Arkansas. So you mean to tell me, say Tennessee loses to Oklahoma, you think Tennessee doesn't come out with the right mindset, still licking their chops, or not licking their chops, licking their wounds, I guess, after a loss at Oklahoma two weeks later? you got to be freaking kidding me. If that were to happen, Tennessee's going to come out and, and just – uh, they're they're going to be ready to play. My point is so that whole argument is is not valid. So sure, can Arkansas beat Tennessee? Anybody can beat anybody. Uh, can Taylor Green have a day? Sure, you know. But I also think that a mobile quarterback, Tennessee defensive line, is going to have something to say about that as well. So um, I wholeheartedly disagree with the stake about Taylor Green leads Arkansas to an upset of Tennessee. But it's called a bowl prediction for a reason. Okay, um, one more to get into, and that's number four. The SEC's top offense is Alabama. Essentially, what it says is Alabama is going to edge Tennessee out and being the SEC's best offense. So, even if that's the case, and Alabama leads the league in offense, first year under a new scheme, first year under a new quarterback or a new head coach scheme with a quarterback playing in this new scheme, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But if Tennessee finishes second in the SEC in total offense, Tennessee's had a really, really good year offensively. So, um, sure, you want to finish first, but if Tennessee finishes second in the SEC in total O, you take that because that means you're a top 10 offense in America. That means you're probably a top five offense in America, just like what that other bowl prediction was about Nico leading Tennessee to a top five offense. So, uh, those were some of the Tennessee related bold takes from Connor O'Gara Saturday down south. You can check out the full article, the other 19 bold takes that are out there, 20 bold takes that are out there, not regarding Tennessee, but, uh, 
Uh, do you agree or disagree with some of these bold takes about the University of Tennessee over here at Saturday Down South? Let me know. And more of your questions at underscore Kaner and at Lockdown Balls. Thanks so much for tuning in here. Making Locked On Balls your first listen, your first watch. Make Locked On SEC. Make Locked On College Football your second and third listen here today. Get into those questions for tomorrow's show. At underscore Kaner, at Locked On Balls. But most importantly, tell a friend. Tell a friend about this podcast. Tell a friend about this show. Weekday mornings, 30 minutes or less. We get the basis. We get everything you need to know about Tennessee football that morning. And uh, let's grow the show. Get in front of more and more Tennessee fans as football season is here. Come back tomorrow for a mailbag edition of the show. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. This is Locked On Balls.